Thank you for watching the Table Community Church video podcast. We hope you enjoyed this week's message. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we continue in your presence. Father, I pray that you would help us to understand what it means to find our delight in you, our joy in you. Father, I pray that you would teach us today that through the work of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to understand where we've gotten things wrong and how to make things right. May what we do here not just be isolated to what takes place in this service or in this room, but that God, ultimately our faith would be that thing that guides us throughout our lives. Because God, I think when we're really honest, apart from you, we're not really sure what life is about or if there's meaning in life at all. But life following you gives us hope and purpose. And so God, I pray that you would help us to understand that today. We recognize today our dependence upon you, and I pray that you would be at work in all of our hearts and lives, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. What well, is good to see everybody this morning. If you're a guest with us, um, my name is Bill. Just glad that you are here. I'll just be real honest. Um, it has been a day so far at uh, the Table Community Church. Um, so if you're a guest, and you're like, hey, wh- what distinguishes this church from others? There could be maybe many things, but here's what I would say today is we are not perfect, far from perfect. Um, We have mornings where microphones don't work or we uh, flood men's bathrooms. Um, So if you got to go, find somewhere else. Um, We don't want those things to happen, but they do. Um, So we don't take ourselves too seriously. Um, We just are who we are. Um, But hopefully we make it through... uh, the service and the message, you know, yesterday we, my family and I, we went to a restaurant with the rest of the city of Roanoke, and so things took longer, you know, than, than it should have, and, and things like that, and the server just came up to me and said, man, like, I hope you give us another chance, and I was like, I get it, like, things happen, so if you're a guest with us, listen, give us another chance, <laughs> things happen. I want you to imagine a scene with me. I don't know if you're like me. I find that I sometimes regularly dream about being in school. I, I have never asked anybody why that's the case. I'm not sure I want to know uh, for fear of what that might reveal about how messed up I actually am. So, but I find myself dreaming sometimes about being in school. And so I want you to dream, kind of put yourself in this scene with me. Back in middle school. And every day in PE class, the students are lined up so that teams can be chosen for the day's activities. The coach designates two captains, and those captains choose the team. And regardless of the activity or sport that is uh, to be played that day, you find that you are always overlooked and the last person who's picked every single time. And there are some days when you just kind of look to your right and left at those who you are standing next to, hoping that there is someone else who is deemed as unworthy as you often feel, but there you are left alone, feeling unwanted and useless, not good at anything. But then one day the unthinkable happens. And a new captain is chosen. Now, at first, you didn't really think that, think anything of this because you just assumed that it would go on like it does every other day. The same thing. It just happens over and over again. And so, you know, because of past experience, you don't really need to pay attention to the beginning of this process as people are chosen because you're always picked last. And so you don't need to pay attention to what's happening. So you just often find yourself looking down at the floor in front of you. And then it seems like it's almost off in the distance. You hear it, Stuart. What? He can't be talking about me. 
you look around wondering if there's a new student in class that has your same last name. Maybe you didn't notice this new kid. And you look up and there he is. Stuart, get over here. You're on my team. Me? Yes, you. I want you. And for the very first time, you walk over as the very first pick. And for the first time in your life, You felt like somebody thought you were good at something. Maybe it was something that you didn't even know existed, but somebody said you had value. You were chosen to be on a team and given purpose. A couple of weeks ago, as I was kind of just putting together some thoughts on today's message, I just did a Google search. Like, what's the importance of purpose, having purpose in life? And I got to tell you about an article that I found. So again, this is just a Google search. Results come up. I kind of scroll through the first couple. Nothing really sticks out. And near the top, though, was this article that was put out by the University of Minnesota. So I looked at the title and it said something about like, hey, the importance of having purpose in life. And there was a little bit of a description. And as I looked at it, I thought I knew what this article was about. I thought what I would find is that it would say having purpose in life is important because when you, have, you know your purpose, you have direction, and that leads to happier life and, and more fulfillment and things like that. I thought I knew what it would say. It would say some things that we could guess if we had time to do it on our own, but things that are good, but nothing of real substance. And I got to tell you, I was shocked by what I read. Purpose is so important. And it did. It talked about some of the psychological benefits to having purpose in life. But do you know that there are significant health benefits to knowing and living out your purpose? In fact, having purpose in life is a factor in living longer. I don't know if you know this, but on the planet, on earth, there are these places that are referred to as blue zones. Blue zones are places where people live that life expectancy is significantly longer than it is in other places. And what's odd is they're not just in one location or one area. It's spread around the globe. And so people have done research in these blue zones trying to figure out what is it about that place or those people that causes them to live longer. Well, one survey of people living in blue zones, they surveyed people who were over 100 years old. And they found that they had a number of things in common, one of which was they all had a clear sense of purpose. Another study, this was done of Chinese men uh, related to cardiovascular disease. And what they found was that having purpose is a potential keeping someone from having a heart attack who had, had already been diagnosed with cardiovascular disease. And someone who doesn't have a clear sense of purpose, the fatality rate as a result of a heart attack is significantly higher. If you don't have a sense of purpose, you are 2.4, which is not a lot, I get that, but 2.4% more likely to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's than someone who has a clear sense of purpose. Having a sense of purpose helps you to deal with pain and negative events in your life better than someone who doesn't have a sense of purpose. So the point of this article, this research that was gathered together by the University of Minnesota, they said purpose is really important. Yes, in psychological ways, but also in physiological ways too. It is really, really important. But yet what I think is, as I just kind of observe people, I think so often we just meander through life, not having a clear sense of purpose, where we feel like that middle school kid who gets overlooked every day and is told over and over again, you're not good at anything, you don't have a purpose. If that's how you feel, this is what I want you to know. And I don't want this to sound corny, but I want you to know there is a new captain and he's picking you to be on his team and he's giving you a purpose. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Our Christmas series that we started last week, Melissa started it last week, it's called The Gift. And of course, the greatest gift that God has given to us is the gift of his son, Jesus. And so we're going to talk about that throughout the series. Uh, The Savior of the world, as Rachel sang about just a, a couple of minutes ago. But God gives us a lot of gifts. 
And one of the gifts that God gives to us is the gift of purpose. And so we're going to talk about that today as we look at the call of God on Mary, the mother of Jesus. So if you've got your Bible, I invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 1. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. So Luke, it's early on in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. So Luke chapter 1, 26 through 38. Now I will tell you this call of Mary, Mary's purpose is very unique. No one else has ever been called to be the mother of the Son of God. But yet at the same time, there are some details in Mary's story that helps us to understand why we know we can have purpose. And that's what we're going to look at today. But let me read this section. If you don't have a Bible to be on the screen, or you can navigate your way to our live event and follow along on the YouVersion Bible app. Starting in verse 26, Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be, since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born, will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I'm the Lord's servant. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed her. Mary's story is unique. Her call is unique. The events surrounding her call and her purpose are very unique. So this passage is not one that we can look at and say, Look what happened to Mary. Those same things can happen to you. It's not going to happen. But there's a lot in Mary's story that helps us to understand the why, why we know we have purpose. And so I want to talk about that. But before we talk about the why, I want to talk about the what. What is our purpose? I'll I'll say it this way. Our purpose is to glorify God. That is what we were created to do. And that's a very broad purpose that's applicable to all of us. It's applicable to all of us. And then as we understand a little bit more about who we are, who God has uniquely made us to be, we can understand then a little bit more about how to live that out. We don't have time to talk about that in this format. We can't talk about the specifics of that, but we can just talk about this broad purpose that we were created to glorify God. And I know that for some of you, you may not understand what that means. It's kind of church language. Maybe it's really broad and ambiguous. So let me just kind of break it down a little bit. To understand this, we have to go back to the beginning in the way that humanity was created. It's in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 that we read about the creation of man. It says that God created mankind in his image and in his likeness, he created them. And so what we find is that as human beings, we're created in the image of God or in God's likeness, or we are created to reflect who God is. We are God's representative here on earth. And this is something that is different about us as human beings than anything else in creation. We are created to be a reflection of God. And when we reflect God well, that's what it means to glorify God. So we could say our purpose is this, that we are created to make God look good. That's what we're created to do. We're created to make God look good. That's Genesis 1. The problem is in Genesis 3, we read that sin enters the picture. And that kind of messes things up a little bit. And so as a result of sin, because of our sin, what naturally happens to us is that we begin to want to make ourselves look good. And we're not concerned about making anybody else look good, especially God. And so what we find is that we need help in recapturing our purpose again. And in part, that's what the work of Jesus does for us. 
Because when we come to believe that Jesus is the Son of God who laid down his life for us, that died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead, we are then brought back into a relationship with God and given a new purpose. And when we understand what God has done for us, that we are saved or brought into a relationship with God that lasts forever, not because of anything that we do, but all because of what God has done for us, we realize it's not about us and it's all about him. And we begin to, we embrace that call. We begin to want to make God look good again. And what we understand is that the way that we make God look the best is as we point others back to him as well so that they understand who he is and what he's done. And that's our call. Our purpose is to make God look good. And we do that primarily by pointing other people back to him. And I want you to know, this is something that we can do. And in part, Mary's story helps us understand why. Because in Mary's story, what we understand is that God uses the humble and the willing. At the very beginning, we read what just look like innocent details of the setting of this encounter between an angel and Mary. It says in verse 26, the sixth month, sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, that's what it's referencing, that Gabriel was sent to a city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. And he's just a man. He's of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And again, we just look at that and say these are just details that describe the setting, but there is so much meaning that's packed into this. It's in those words that we understand that God uses the humble and the willing because there is nothing in Mary's life that would cause us to think that she's the perfect one to be chosen. If we were writing the story of the birth of the Son of God, we would not have chosen Mary. We would have chosen someone like Elizabeth. She was John the Baptist's mother. Melissa talked about her last week and in, in, in the event of the announcement of John the Baptist's birth. She was the one who was a little bit older. She was the one who was married to a priest. She was the one who lived in the capital of, Jer- uh, uh, of Israel in Jerusalem. Not Mary. What we find out about Mary, here's the interesting thing, is that we find out her name last. But she lives in the town of Nazareth in Galilee, a long way from the city of Jerusalem. She was just married to this, or engaged, betrothed to this guy named Joseph, and nobody knows who he is either. But for some reason, God chose Mary. There wasn't anything about her that would say, she's the perfect candidate. She lived in this town of Nazareth that was referred to as nothing good comes out of Nazareth. But God uses the humble and the willing. And just so that you don't think that this is a one-time event, this is just an anomaly in the way that God does things, the truth is that God often does things just a little bit differently. I don't want you to think that Normally, God chooses the most athletic, the tallest, the smartest, the whatever when he's picking people for his team because he always just did things different. In the Old Testament, we read about the prophet Samuel who was told by God to go and anoint Israel's next king. And God told Samuel, hey, don't worry about what he looks like. I don't care about that. I don't care about his outward appearance. I care about what's on the inside. I care about his heart. God told Samuel to go to the house of Jesse, because one of his sons was to be named the next king. And so Samuel did that. He went to Jesse and said, hey, you know, God has said one of your sons is going to be the next king. And so Jesse got all of his sons together and Samuel went and interviewed each one of them, starting with the oldest and working his way down. And he got to the end of the line and it was really confused because he went to Jesse and said, Jesse, I don't know what's happening. None of these guys are it. Do you, is there, like, do you have another son somewhere? He said, well, yeah, I actually do. It's David, the youngest. He's like out in the field, but there's no way he's the guy. But he was. And he was Israel's greatest king. In Isaiah 6, we read about this young prophet, Isaiah, who has this vision where he is able to enter into the throne room of God. 
His reaction to that is, woe is me, I'm ruined. He was saying, I think I'm going to die because he knew the verse that says, no one sees God's face and lives. But God was gracious to him. His sin had been atoned for. And he was allowed to take in this scene where he sees the holiness of God and the the fullness of who God is on display. There are angels around singing holy, holy, holy all the time. And as he's taking in this scene, he hears what's really kind of an internal conversation of God. He says, who will we send? Who will go for us? And before he ever knew what the job was, Isaiah said, just send me. I'll go, whatever it is. God uses the humble and the willing. And this seems to be in contrast to everything that we see in our culture today. Because what is interesting in, in, in David's case, as well as in Mary's, what we don't see is self-promotion waiting for the special assignment. They're just faithfully doing what it is that they would do on a normal day. Not necessarily anything special, but what we find is that God uses the humble and the willing. And what qualifies you for this assignment to live out the purpose to make God look good by pointing other people back to him, it is not what's on your resume, but it's God's grace. Gabriel shows up to Mary and Mary reacts in the same way that any normal person would when an angel shows up to tell them something. She's scared to death. Who is this? Why is he here? Is this the good angel or the bad angel? What did I do? Who knows what's going on in her mind? And Gabriel says, Mary, don't be afraid because you found favor with God. And often as we read that, we assume, well, that means that she had been doing some really good stuff and God noticed it and that's why he chose her. That is not what that phrase means. Now, I'm sure that Mary was an upstanding young lady. I'm sure she was. But yet at the same time, that phrase, she found favor with God, does not mean that God looked at her life and said, you're doing a bunch of great things. I'm choosing you. It just means that God chose her for some reason that was only known to God. It was just because God said so. As a kid growing up, the thing that my parents would tell me that used to frustrate me like nothing else was when they would say, I would ask why about something and they would say, because I said so. And I used to hear that as a kid and I would think to myself, when I have kids, I will never say that. (laughs) I find that I often say that and it's not because I don't have a reason, but it's just too hard to explain the reason to my kids, or maybe they won't understand the reason. And so I say, just because I said so, and you need to trust me. It wasn't because Mary was doing some great things. though. Listen, I'm sure she she was faithful and she wanted to please God with her life. But the reason that God chose her is just because God said so. And I know God has chosen you and given you a purpose, not because of all the great things that you've done, but I'm sure you've done some great things. But it's just because God said so. For some reason, God chose to extend his grace to you. You know, if you're here today, and you would say that you've come to the point in your life where you have trusted Jesus as your savior. You absolutely believe without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the son of God who laid down his life for you and rose again from the dead. The reason that you believe that is because God has extended his grace to you. And open your eyes to your need of Jesus and drew yourself to him. It's because of God's grace. And if you're here and you're not really sure about all of that stuff, you're not really sure about the claims of the Bible and Jesus, listen, I want you to know what God is doing in your life is he is now extending his grace to you and drawing you to himself as well. And he wants you to say yes. You know, the reason that we're able to make changes in our lives after we come to, to faith in Jesus It's not because of the hard work that we do, that we may do some hard work. The reason we're able to make those changes is because of the grace of God. Grace being the goodness of God that's extended to people who do not deserve it. It's God that extends his grace to us, calls us to himself, and begins to change our lives. And it's God's grace that says we're qualified for service. Now listen, God will use the things on your resume, but that's not what qualifies you. It's just because God said so.
God uses the humble and the willing. And I want you to know we can live out this purpose. And so in the midst of the ups and downs of life, because we know we have purpose, we have to remain faithful and continue to follow and continue to trust. The reason being, there will be times when you're not really sure that you're making a difference. You're not really sure that you're doing anything right. There may be times in your life where you're not even sure that life has a purpose. But remain faithful and trust that God has called you to make him look good by pointing other people back to him. Uh, you may have, some of you may have picked up on this. There's a lot of, there are a lot of parallels between the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist and the announcement of the birth of Jesus. Gabriel sent to do both, sent to an individual to make the announcement of a special son, both to Zechariah and to Mary. The reactions to the announcement are similar, but yet very, very different. And this is something that we are, I think, as we study these passages we're supposed to pick up on. So Zachariah, when he was told that Elizabeth, his wife, was going to have a son, his response was, how can I be sure of this? If you break down his words, it was the question of a skeptic. He's saying like, hey, we're old. We haven't had any kids. How do I know what you're saying is actually true? Mary's response, though, similar yet different. She says, how will this be? It's not the question of a skeptic. It's the question of one who believes but is saying, how is this going to work itself out? In a lot of ways, what Gabriel told her, it, it didn't quite make sense. I mean, she wasn't married. She was young. She didn't know what this meant for the rest of her life. How, how will this be? Like, what do I need to do? What's my part in this process? What does this mean for the rest of my life? As we seek to live out the purposes of God, it may not always make sense to us how we're to go about making God look good and point others back to him, but we have to believe that God can and will carry out his purpose through us. So we can do it. Gabriel said, Mary, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you so that the child you will give birth to will be called the Son of God. And he said, Mary, you need to remember this. Nothing is impossible with God. And I wonder how often she thought about that phrase. Nothing is impossible with God. As she watched Jesus grow up, did she think nothing is impossible with God? When she wasn't sure that Jesus knew what he was doing in the early parts of his earthly ministry, I wonder if she thought, but nothing's impossible with God. I wonder if, as she watched her son die in agony on that cross, if she thought to herself, I don't know what's happening, but nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. God just chooses to do things a little bit different. 1 Corinthians 1 says that God uses the foolish things to shame the wise, the weak things, to shame the strong. It may not make sense to us why God would choose to use sinful and often selfish people like me and like you to make him look good, but that's what God has done. He's chosen us to be on his team, and he's given us purpose. And if you don't know how to live that out, what we would love is for you to be on our team. A couple of weeks ago, if you were with us, you heard about what's happening in our student ministry. Wayne talked a little bit about that this morning and, and in our kids' ministry. And, you know, a great way to reflect God well and point other people back to him is by investing in the next generation and helping them to understand who Jesus is and what he's done. There are other opportunities too, but I want you to know that you've been given a purpose to reflect God well, to make God look good by pointing other people back to him. I love what Mary said at the end of this entire episode. 
And there are all kinds of questions in her mind still. There are still so many unanswered questions. But yet she says this. May it be to me, just as you've said. Let's do it. Let's go. And as you think about the importance of living out your life purpose, maybe you're not exactly sure how it's going to work itself out. Maybe you're not exactly sure what God is going to do in your life or what he wants you to do, but maybe that's what our heart needs to be. A lot of questions, but let's do it. May it be to me, just as you've said. Let's go. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for reaching out to us when we were lost in our sin and drawing us by your grace to yourself. Thanks for choosing us who often feel overlooked. And maybe there are times we we don't feel like we're good at anything, but God, you've given us purpose to make you look good and to point other people back to you. And so, Father, I pray that we would hold on to that. It would be an accurate reflection of who you are. And that you'd be at work around us, drawing others to yourself too. God, if there's anyone here today who would say that they've not said yes to Jesus through the work of your spirit, bring them to salvation. Help them to know that you love them and you want them on your team. Thanks for the hope that you give to us. You just do things differently sometimes and it may not make sense to us. But because you've said so, help us to trust in you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching. For more information on The Table Community Church, visit us at our website at www.thetablecc.com.